up here she is going to read a passage for us from 1 Timothy 6 13 through 15. In the sight of God who gives life to everything in Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords.
that stone was moved for good for the lamb that conquered death and the bread rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church was christ was born Welcome, Pastor Goody Coons, to come on up here. He's going to pray for us this morning. Let us bow our heads in prayer to the Holy God. Father God, we give you praise this day. We're here to worship you in truth and spirit. We're just not attending, Lord. Jesus Christ, we need you to touch our hearts this day. Holy Spirit, walk up and down these seats and touch us on the shoulder. Let us know that we're here in truth and spirit to really worship you. Help us to humble ourselves this day, Father. Help us to humble ourselves this day, Jesus. Help us right now to really want to be in your presence. Forget about things of home. Forget about things of work. And give you a worship like the church has not done for a season. We ask you, Lord, to help us to want to be holy as you are holy. Help us to understand what it means. It's not a word. It's a life. It's a, it's a changed life, changed by you, by your touch upon our, upon our total being through our belief in you, Jesus. We ask you to be with us right now as we truly try to focus on what it means to be holy. We ask you, Lord, to touch those in our congregation, in our home right now, that are sick and different reasons. We just ask your Holy Spirit to reach the, to walk in, walk to their home and be with them right now. Let them uh, feel your power to be uh, to be he- well and to be healed healed by their of their sickness. Help us, Lord, to become a house of prayer again. We all pray. We pray many times as we eat. We pray many times as to, uh, for this and that. But Lord, we need to be a house of prayer again. Humble people getting on our knees and truly spending time and praying to God and saying, Lord, help America. America is full of evil this day, too much. And the church has let down. We need to get back to what it means to be a house of prayer to make a difference for the kingdom of God. We give you praise this day, Lord. We're sitting here in your presence. We can't wait to hear more of what the pastor has to say. Help us to take it and let it be attentive to our hearts. Help us, help us, Lord, to let the things he says reach down in us. Let us not leave here today wondering where we're going to eat. Let us leave here today saying, Lord, how can I apply that to my life? How can I be more like you, Jesus? How can I be holy as you are? Help us do that, Lord. We just give you praise and thanks for all that you do for us in your church. In the holy, holy, holy name of Jesus to Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Y'all may be seated. At this time, we're going to um, transition into our reflection song here. And it's not about just the Holy Spirit today, but our community and spreading the word of the Holy Spirit. So I chose this song because it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. And if you know the words, go ahead and sing along with us this morning, please.
thousands of years, the church has been a symbol of refuge and hope. Old or new, archaic or modern, this structure has long been home to the ideals of faith, hope, and love. But are these principles confined to live within these walls? Do they exist only among the pews and stained glass windows? Do they reside only in the Bibles and hymnals to be opened at service and then laid to rest until we return again? Could it be that church is more than a building? Could it be a hand reaching out to someone in need? Could it be the embrace of a friend? Could it be a random act of kindness? Could it be that church is more than simply a place? It is home to a calling that goes far deeper, a sanctuary 
not built to confine us away from life's trials, but to empower us to share the love of Christ with those around us. It is an opportunity to work together and effectively touch a world in need. It is an opportunity to be more than a building. Last Sunday, we spoke about the birth of the church, the birthday of the church through Pentecost, and how when the Holy Spirit came and touched the lips and the mouths of the disciples on that day, they were able to bring 3,000 to the Lord, not because of their efforts or wonderful speeches, but because of the movement of the Holy Spirit. And today, we're going to continue with that tone of the movement of the Holy Spirit as we celebrate Trinity Sunday. And Trinity Sunday is the Sunday that we celebrate God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And today as we gather, we're going to look into a, a goodbye passage and a farewell passage. But the title for today's message is Dealing with Christians. And not easiest thing to do, but we're going to be talking about dealing with Christians and what the Bible tells us on how, and, and, and then also we're going to study about what the Apostle Paul uh, spoke to this church of uh, the church of Corinth. But when we look into um, this passage, we're going to see this is Paul saying goodbye to a church. Now, we often feel that goodbye is a hard thing to do and is a difficult thing to do often when we try to, to connect with someone. Well, a gentleman, a young man was in a supermarket and a woman kept looking, looking at him and he kept feeling that he was being watched. And, and throughout the, his time at the supermarket, you know, gathering the things that he needed, he kept looking at this woman staring at him. And as he was going into a cash register, she cut in front of him and said, I'm sorry, you probably noticed I was looking at you. And she said, I, I just recently lost my son and I see that he, he, you look just like him. And you just have this, you remind me so much of my son. You know, I never had the opportunity to say goodbye to him. So... When I leave, would you mind saying goodbye, mother? He said, well, I think I could manage to do that. So he, he was thinking, well, this is an odd request, but, you know, it's a sweet old lady, so I might as well just go ahead and do that. So she, um, she, she got her shopping and got her bags, and as she was leaving, he goes, goodbye, mother. She turned around and just thanked him and, and left. And he paid for his, uh, his items. And when the, when the final number came, it was a little bit larger than, than he thought. He said, eh, this is a larger number. He goes, yes. He, uh, your mother said you're going to be taking care of her bill. <laughs> Saying goodbye is not always what we want to do. But Paul had the opportunity to speak to this one church, a church that he struggled with because they struggled with doing the right things. They were a church that kept getting themselves in trouble because people were still living a lot in the world. So Paul wrote uh, to the church, exhorting them and bringing them different kind of ideas on how to live as Christians. We, we read in the first book of Corinth, in, in chapter, in, in different uh, times, we, we see in uh, uh, chapter 5 and 6, he talks about sin, sin in the church, and how we should uh, handle sin. And then chapter 7, he talks about relationships. Chapter 11, we read often as the Lord's Supper. And then we also as, uh, read in chapter 14 about how to worship. And then the second book of, Corinth, uh, of, Corinth, uh, of Corinthians, we also read about how Paul is trying to lead them into a life that is worthy of being called children of God. So Paul finalizes and ends this with a few words, and that's what we're going to read today, the final words, the, the goodbye that he writes to this church of 
um, in Corinth and uh, the church of the Corinthians. If you stand with me as we read the word of the Lord today in full reverence to what he has to share with us today. And we pray that God uses me to bring his word uh, to us. Thus say the word of the Lord in the second book of Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 11. We're going to read all the way to 14. Thus say the word of the Lord. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Father, we thank you for these words. May we glean from them what you have in store for us. And Father, may we live transformed, renewed, and empowered by your word. By your word. And may we recognize that what you have in store for us is for our transformation, that we may get to know you better. We pray this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We see here a passage that is quite interesting, is the ending of the letter. So he is sharing with them final thoughts, things that they, he, they need to know, but things that he wants to them to remember. It's his goodbye. So what we see is that he begins by saying, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice or have joy, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be one mind, live in peace. This is unity. And what we see in this passage is that we are made for unity. God created us to be one, one with each other, one together, one as a family of God. So it's not that we are all in one accord. We all believe the exact same things. We all say the exact thing, same things. Or we are all wearing the same things. It's just saying we are one because he's the one that makes us one. You know, he's speaking to the church but he's also speaking to the individuals because they're the ones that make up the church. But when we put things in order, when we strive for, and, and some different um, Bible translations use when we aim for perfection or when we aim for, uh, to, for restoration, or the NIV has when we strive for full restoration, we're looking at it as a goal. As a continuous thing that we do. It's not that once you are restored, you're good. It says strive for, aim for, continue to pursue that goal. Uh, this week I had the opportunity to go to or through uh, the, the town of Dublin. And there's a lot of people now because there's a large golf tournament uh, happening. It's called the Memorial Tournament. And, and as I uh, uh, passed through, I... I saw a lot of people, you know, wearing different golf branded stuff. And, and I, I, watched, I watched some of, of the tournament. And when I was looking at them, and I am amazed at how well they're able to get the ball, you know, 400 uh, yards. And, and it's just amazing how professionals play, play the game. I am in no uh, way, shape, or form a professional or even a good amateur. I, I like to dabble, you know, and, and, and I like to spend my time in the woods looking for balls. Anyway, <laughs> but the goal of the game is a hole in one. That is the ultimate goal. Now, it's very, very difficult to hit a goal, a, a hole in one. Mostly, uh, when they're able to do so is in a par three, which means they take three shots to get over there, which means it's not that far. But it's a goal that every golfer aims for. They see the little flag, they tee up and try to hit the hole. Because if they do a hole-in-one, 
on a par three, they just gain themselves two strokes. And that is something that they strive for. And every time they play, it's like, oh, it was so close. I got it on the green. Oh, so close. They don't give up. Oh, I wasn't able to do it. I'm, I'm done. No, they strive. And each time they strive for it. And each time that they go back, they try again and try again until they get it. The last one on a professional was two weeks ago on May 21st. And it was a Michael Block on a 151-yard par 3. He was able to hit a hole in one. And he was the 28th time since 2000. Uh, since 1983, that a PGA golfer was able to hit a home, uh, a hole in one. Since 83, 28 people were able to do that. It's not even one a year. It's that rare. But it's the goal is to get the ball in the hole with as fewer strokes as possible. Our aim, our goal as Christians is perfection. Now, it's not a perfection that we are going to be made, you know, that we're going to be better than anyone else, or we're going to be perfect physically or, 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 or spiritually or mentally or whatever. It's a goal to strive for unity. And we are made perfect when we are in one accord. It doesn't mean that we are homogeneous. It means that we are one together. It's our differences that makes us one. It's our, up, it's our upbringings. It's our, it's, it's our um, personalities. And when we're together, we are perfect because God is in it. So what makes us perfect is not the fact that we are together in one room. It's the fact that we are together in one room with Him. So John 17, verse, um, verses 20 to 23 uh, tells us um, when Jesus was praying for his disciples, he tells us in verse 20, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. In other words, it's praying for us. And then he said that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you have gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus is praying for our unity. That's how we become perfect. That's what we strive for. That's what we aim for. That's what we look for as Christians. We are made for unity. But it's even more than that. It tells us that we are made to be different. We are made to encourage one another. We are made to be of one mind and to live in peace. To live in peace is not the absence of war. Peace takes work because there's differences that we need to work out. There's, there's uh, challenges that we need to, uh, to face together. So living in peace is a great goal. The university, the Duke University had a study called On Peace of Mind. They're trying to find out what creates peace of mind? And they interviewed and studied several people. And they came up to eight um, definitions or ways to have peace of mind. And when I read them, I thought, you know what? This is the kind of thing that we as Christians should be very much aware of and very familiar with. The first thing that they say that someone that have... Uh, being able to contribute greatly to emotional and mental stability to have peace of mind is, number one, the absence of suspicion and resentment. Have you noticed that people that are suspicious about everything or resent at something never have peace of mind? They're always upset. Well, they say the absence of suspicion and resentment, nursing a grudge was a major factor 
in unhappiness. Number two, not living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures leads to depression. If we keep thinking about the past, we'll not have peace of mind. Number three, not wasting time and energy finding conditions you cannot change. Cooperate with life instead of trying to run away from it. Let's just not waste time and energy with things we can control. Number, two, number four, force yourself to stay involved with the living world. Resist the temptation to withdraw and become reclusive during periods of emotional stress. Live life. Number five, refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. Well, accept the fact that nobody gets through life without some sorrow and misfortune. Number six, cultivate the old-fashioned virtues. Love, humor, compassion, loyalty, faith, so many virtues that we can cultivate. Number seven, do not expect too much of yourself. Well, that's a hard one to do. When there is too wide a gap between self-expectation and your ability to meet the goals you have set, feelings of inadequacy are inevitable. Number eight, find something bigger than yourself to believe. Now, this is not a religious study. This is a, a university study. Find something bigger than yourself to believe in. Now, many people believe in like, oh, I'm going to believe in the country. I'm going to believe in this cause or whatever. Something bigger than ourselves. But we Christians, we have something greater, something bigger that we can believe in. And we can be fed through. We can be touched. We can be renewed. We can be transformed through. So when we look into having a peace of mind, we see that the world is looking for that. And they found ways. But we have to find ways too. We have to be together with one another. And we have to create this sense of peace by loving, encouraging, embracing one another. And the love of God and the peace will be with you is what it tells us here. It ends. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So when we attempt to care for one another, to honor one another, to encourage one another, to bless one another, then we have the way to experience the love and grace of God. Now, pastor, the title is dealing with Christians. Well, you told us what the passage tells us that we have to be together, but how do we deal with Christians? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that we have to do is encourage one another. So, we encourage one another. Encourage one another. When we encourage one another, we're able to experience a beautiful and amazing way to experience what it means to be a Christian. I'm going to be honest with you. Being a Christian is not an easy life. It's not one life. We're not going to be living in, in, in a bed of roses or enjoying bliss every day. Actually, we're going to be attacked more often when we follow Christ fully because the enemy will tempt us. We will struggle with, with self-perception. We'll struggle with our own understanding of ourselves. We'll struggle with knowing what God wants for us. We will struggle. But when we encourage one another, we are going together through life. It's not just saying, I am alone. Because when we encourage one another, when we encourage our fellow Christians, we are lifting them up. We are giving them energy. We are saying, we are in this together. So we encourage one another. We, each one of us should be encouragers. We, each one of us should encourage because that is what makes us different from the world. As we encourage one another. As we lift each other up. A few years ago, we had the Pony Express. Now, the Pony Express was um, riders that rode on ponies or a little bit bigger 
And we, we don't think about those ponies that the kids want. We're talking about horses, but they just call them ponies. The Pony Express went from St. Joseph, Missouri, all the way to California. And the way it was set up is a rider would have a satchel with, with letters or with, with information, or with staff to take to, to the next location. And every 10 to 15 miles, there was a relay station. So they would ride the horses to the next uh, relay station. And then as, as they were getting closer, they will yell out, Pony Express coming, Pony Express coming. And the manager of the relay station would hear that and have just a few minutes before having a horse ready for that rider. The rider would hop off that particular horse and then hop into a new horse and do another 10 to 15 miles. And when he would be getting closer to there, he would just get into another horse. So this way, the horses weren't dying because when they first started, that was happening. And they were able to keep horses alive and healthy. And they were able to keep riders to be able to go through the journey. But when it was time for the rider to rest, the rider would get over there hand over the satchel with all the information to a new rider who would just go and continue the journey to take that precious cargo all the way to its destination. We as Christians, when we encourage each other, we're working together. We are lifting each other up. We are preparing the horses for one another. We are, we are getting the message across together. It's not a one horse and one rider enterprise. This is a work together. With the advent of the telegraph, the Pony Express ended. But God has created us to be one. And, that, and by being one, we are naturally expressing who God is to us. As we love one another. As we encourage one another. So we are ready to work together. As we share the message and the work on building not only the kingdom by encouraging and by lifting each other up. So we build the kingdom by doing that. So we encourage. The other thing we have to do is we have to be family. You know, we as children of God become family. That's why he starts by saying, finally, brothers and sisters. We are brothers and sisters. That is family. And we have families, and church and family is interchangeable. I never, ever invited someone to church. I don't like to invite people to church because it sounds so cold. It sounds so, like, cultish. It sounds like, you know, I am, like, holier than thou kind of. Would you like to come to my church? When they meet me and they ask me, oh, you're a pastor. Where do you pastor? I say, well, I pastor in Columbus at Church of the Nazarene on Nolan Tenji. And, and if you ever have the opportunity, I'd love for you to meet my family, my church family. You know, we're different, but we love each other. We care for one another. So if I invite people to church, they are thinking building with a, a guy with a polyester suit up front, you know, and an organ and, you know, or we don't know what kind of ideas they have of church. But when we are inviting to family, we're not inviting to the building. We're inviting to a relationship. We're inviting to a connection with people, not with a building. We just had uh, last week the graduation of our children for the child care, you know, those that are going into kindergarten. And I invited all the parents to, to come and check out our, our family on Sundays. Because this is family. This is how I look at it. This is how I, I treat. And that's how I'm being treated, like family. And when we look at family, things change. And Paul goes even further by saying that we should greet each other with a holy kiss. Well, he doesn't say in, in his vernacular, pucker up, Christians. 
He's not saying, you know, you guys should be like, you know, lip service everybody or giving, gi giving kisses to everybody. No, that's not what he's saying. During that time, Christians were very, very uh, different from the world. People would notice. But they were still strangers. They still did not know each other. So Paul says, give each other a kiss. A kiss was reserved only for family members. Only family members could give kisses. Now, I grew up in Portugal. And by growing up in Portugal, I grew up in a culture that embraced kissing quite often. And every time we would go to church, we would have to kiss everyone. Every time we would go to family, we kiss everyone. It, now, it's not on the lips, it's on the face, but we had that culture. I never kissed a stranger. Now, uh, the good news is that men don't have to kiss men. So I praise God for that. So I didn't grow up. So I, I kissed my father, my grandfather, and, and, or my grandfathers, and, and that's about it. Men don't kiss men. Women kiss women, men kiss women. Uh, Women and women kiss men as well. And it's on the cheek. And it's very, it's very tender, but it's very quick. Just two kisses and, and that's it. Now, as a teenager, I, um, I already have a personality that I was very uh, able to make new friends. But I never kissed a stranger girl or, um, or have uh, ever been kissed by someone who... Who are stranger to me. Because you just don't do that. If it's a stranger, I don't know. But if there's a girl that I would be interested in knowing, I would ask a friend that would know that girl, and saying, would you introduce me to her? And he would say, yes. And you'd go, hi, this is Sam, and this is the girl, whatever. And I would say, well, hi. And then I give two kisses. You know, all is starting on the right. Give two kisses. And from that moment on, every time I saw her, no longer a stranger, she was someone who was familiar, a friend. So we would kiss from that moment on. And when we'd go to church, the church is a family. So we kiss everyone uh, on the cheeks again. I'm being too reminded because Americans sometimes have an idea that, you know, a holy kiss is like a, 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 a kiss, a romantic kiss. It's not a romantic kiss. It's a family connection. And what Paul is saying is there is a family connection with kissing. It means treat each other not as strangers. Treat each other as, as family by giving each other a holy kiss. And it's holy kiss because what makes you family is God who is holy. So we become family. And by becoming family, we treat each other as family. Now, in America, it's very, very, very rare for me to kiss anyone. Uh, it's this culture, and this is, this is not a kissing culture. But hugging is permitted, so I hug everyone. I love hugging because I feel that there's a connection. And I feel... I, I never hugged a stranger, uh, at least that I remember. I may have, you know, and they probably wonder why a stranger hugged them. But hugging is, 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 a, is a way, a physical way to show affection. Now, some people don't like hugging, and I feel sorry for them, but I'm still going to hug them. But hugging becomes a manifestation. It's a holy hug. There's nothing... That there, there, there's nothing inappropriate about it. But when we look at this passage and we think about our own culture, we have to stop for a second and look at the culture that they had done. And the culture said, if you kiss, you are now family. If you have a holy kiss, you are treating each other truly as family. As you hug your family members, your cousins and so forth when you see them. As you hug, uh, every, every time you go to a family reunion, you hug them. And in America, you get the same t-shirt, I've noticed. Uh, it, it's interesting. 
But what makes you family members is not wearing the t-shirt. It's the way you treat each other. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no fights. It doesn't mean that, that there's people that don't like each other. It just means that you are family. And as family, you treat each other uh, intimately in a, in a very nice way. So I have a challenge for you. And the challenge is verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. So the challenge is receive grace of God the Father. Receive, I'm sorry, of the Lord Jesus Christ who extended his grace by dying on the cross. Receive the love of God the Father who loved us in such a way that he gave his only begotten son. And receive the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. What Paul was saying is that the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit work together in our lives. We have the grace of Jesus Christ. We have the love of God. We have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity works together in our lives. So we celebrate by receiving that grace, by receiving that love, by receiving that fellowship. Because when we do so, we are living a life that is worthy of being called a child of God. And as such, we become brothers and sisters. I would like to ask Shannon to come forward as we conclude with a word of prayer. I don't know where you are in your journey with, with Christ. But I do know that when we embrace God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we are embracing a working trinity in our life. And together, we can feel their presence. But alone, we can recognize who He is. But to truly experience the love of God, we need each other. We need to be together. We need unity. And unity doesn't come because we all are the same. But because in our differences, God reveals Himself. So let us Receive that grace, receive that love, and receive that fellowship. Would you stand and sing this last song with me? Holy, holy, holy.
May the grace of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, not only now, but until he returns. Go in peace as you serve God and love one another. Amen. Oh.